Hello, and uh, welcome to another Bible study. Uh, today we're going to be going through Genesis chapter 39. Uh, we're getting back to the story of Joseph. Last week, Genesis 38, we looked at Judah uh, and a large chunk of his life and his story. Uh, we looked at his three sons, his daughter-in-law, Tamar, and we talked last week about um, the idea of the kinsman redeemer uh, in Jewish custom and how Jesus is actually our kinsman redeemer. And we actually compared Tamar to Ruth. Um, but you saw the character of Judah uh, and how he very much um, was accustomed to the culture of the day, uh, lived in the world, so to speak. Now we're going to compare him to his younger brother. So Judah was the fourth old oldest after uh, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi came Judah. And Joseph is the second youngest. Benjamin is the only younger brother uh, under Jacob. So this week we're going to look uh, at Joseph. As you'll recall, in uh, Genesis 37, uh, Joseph was uh, his father's favorite, and Jacob gave him uh, the uh, coat of many colors, um, the elaborate uh, cloak, so to speak, and we were introduced to Joseph as the um, king of dreams. He had multiple dreams uh, that he shared with his brothers about um, the stars bowing down to him and their sheaves of grain bowing down to him, and the brothers couldn't stand him. They hated him because he was the favorite, and uh, from uh, interpretation, it sounds like he was a little bit cocky, too. Uh, in the way that he told his stories. Look, I'm y your sheaves of grain are bowing down to mine. Isn't this amazing? Um, so they sold him into slavery. They, they plotted to actually kill him, um, but it was Judah that spoke up and said, no, let's, um, let's trade him for money so that we can actually gain from his, his, rather than his death, which doesn't bring us any benefit, let's sell him. So they sold him uh, as a slave to the Ishmaelites and Midianites that were traveling south to Egypt. Then Genesis 38, we had the tangent talking about Judah, uh, which we talked all about how it fits perfectly into the timeline, and it's totally appropriate. It's obvious why God put it there. So today we're going to pick right back up with the story of Joseph and uh, his travels down to Egypt uh, and being sold to Potiphar. Um, so before we dig in, why don't you uh, join me and let's pray over this time. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time that we have. We pray that you would bless it, that you would teach us something uh, about Joseph, and through Joseph we can learn something about ourselves and something about you. Use this time, Lord. Speak to each of us, whether we're listening or watching uh, or me. Speak through me, Lord. I pray that I'll be an instrument approved, and these will be your words, not my words. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, we are going to cover uh, nearly all of 39. I'm going to pick up the last um, three verses of 39 we're actually going to do at the start of chapter 40, because I feel like it it breaks naturally there before he ends up in prison. So join me, and we're going to read um, the 20 verses of 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in the eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted him to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. 
no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you bought bought us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph master, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And we'll pick up uh, those next three verses when uh, we join him in prison next week. Okay. Interesting stuff. So we have two elements that we're going to be discussing here. Well, more than that, really, but uh, let's go through each of these things. First off, Joseph was taken down to Egypt. He was sold by his brothers in Genesis 37 to the Ishmaelites and Midianites. So uh, this is a map that we used uh, last week, and it shows, if you look there, you have Hebron just to the left of the Dead Sea. Uh, that's where Joseph started his journey. That's where he was living uh, at the time. Uh, and then he went north to Shechem is where he was looking for his brothers. He didn't find them there. And we spoke about this earlier, that there was a, a man in a field who advised him to go north to Dothan. So he goes north to Dothan, and this is where he encounters his brothers, and his brothers sell him to a caravan of Ishmaelites and Midianites that are traveling south. Uh, this is the journey that they would have taken, uh, going from Dothan through Gaza all the way down to Egypt. So I wanted to know, uh, in modern times, how long would the journey take? I wanted to Google map it and see uh, what it would take. So the interesting thing is, is that uh, Dothan, we don't know where that is, the ancient city. Um, they know that it's in the northern Sumerian hills, and they stipulate that it's uh, roughly 10 kilometers south of the current city of Jenin. So Jenin does exist. It's a Pal Palestinian city in the northern West Bank. So I was able to find Jenin, and then I did a Google Maps uh, directions from there to um, Giza in Egypt. And the interesting thing that I saw, uh, this is the uh, first map that I pulled up for driving, and it's very interesting. They, they don't take what appears to be Highway 40 right along um, the coast there. Google Maps doesn't want you to go through the Gaza Strip. I don't know specifically if that is the reason. Uh, I'm not really sure why, but um, Google Maps, as for driving directions, you go all the way down to uh, Aqaba, uh, which is on the very northern um, point of the Gulf of Aqaba, and then going west um, into Egypt. And if you were to drive all the way down to uh, Aqaba, um, it's a 536-mile journey. That's obviously not the route they would have taken. So then I plotted if you were to walk. And again, even if you were to walk, um, they don't have you travel through the Gaza Strip or, or take a direct path. They have you again for the walking. This is, again, Google Maps, but whatever. So <clears throat> I did find some other research uh, in, in looking at the journey that they would have taken, that uh, the Ishmaelites would have taken, and they stipulate that it would take somewhere between uh, five and seven days for the caravan, caravan to make it from um, Canaan, uh, up in Dothan, all the way down to Egypt. 
imagine the emotions going through for uh, Joseph. He's never left Canaan, uh, and he's going with these foreigners that he doesn't know, um, sold as a slave. He's now a slave. His brothers, his loving family, sold him as a slave. So uh, he goes down, and th this is one of the things we're going to be talking about, is Joseph's character. How does he respond to adversity? How does he respond to the tough situations? He was purchased by uh, Potiphar, uh, the captain of Pharaoh's guard. Potiphar means he whom Ra gives. So Ra, uh, as, as some may know, is the Egyptian sun god. Um, the Egyptians had a polytheistic system of, of many different gods, and Ra was uh, one of the main ones. Um, so he whom Ra gives is the title, Potiphar. Uh, and he was a very high official, the captain of the guard for Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh uh, is a title. It means king. It's very similar to Abimelech, which we saw Abimelech in Genesis 20 as well as 26. Those are two different individuals that both had the title, Abimelech, uh, which um, likely the second one was either the, the son or the grandson of the first one, Abraham. Uh, dealt with the first Abimelech, and then his son Isaac dealt with the second one. This pharaoh is believed to be uh, Sesostris II, uh, whose name might have also been uh, Sunusret II, uh, and he is believed to uh, have reigned from 1894 to 1878, uh, obviously BC. Um, so that's Pharaoh, the king in Egypt. Okay, so uh, the, the first thing that jumped out to me when I was reading through this for the very first time is the number of times that um, the Lord is with Joseph. And we see it here in verse 2, the Lord is with Joseph. Verse 3, the Lord is with him and gave him success in everything he did. Verse 5, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord uh, was on everything Potiphar had. And then in verse 21 and 23, which we'll hit next week, it, it reemphasizes that the Lord was with Joseph. So for me, that just jumps out over and over and over again. And if you've been reading with us through Genesis, this fits the theme. Um, the story of Joseph is not a story of Joseph's success or of um, Joseph's amazing ability to stay positive, though we will talk about that. The story of Joseph is a continued story of Genesis, which is the story of God following through on his promises. That is what Joseph is all about. That is the narrative of Joseph, uh, and that is the narrative of Genesis in general. As we look at the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now we're talking about Joseph, uh, and with each of these situations, everything that happens, it is, a, it is a fulfillment of the promises that God has promised to Israel and to us. So, uh, Genesis 21, 22. Um, I, I want to go through this and just hit on these few verses. You can turn there if you like, but I'm going to hit on a few of them. Um, so, I'll just read them. Genesis 21, 22. At that time, Abimelech and Philcol, the commander of his forces, said to Abraham, God is with you in everything you do. So this is Abimelech the king acknowledging to Abraham in Genesis 21, 22, a secular guy that does not believe in the Jewish God says, okay, clearly your God is with you and is blessing you in everything that you do. Genesis 26, 27 through 28, Isaac Isaac asked them, why have you come to me since you were hostile to me and sent me away? They answered, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you. So we said there ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you. These are secular individuals who, who are looking at these guys, the patriarchs, and saying, clearly there's something different about you. You are blessed and it is wise for us to make an agreement with you not to go and battle against you because clearly your God is with you. The Lord is with you. Genesis 30, 27. But Laban said to him, that's Jacob. Laban said to Jacob, if I have found favor in your eyes, please stay. I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. 
These are three different individuals that all look at the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and say, God is clearly with you uh, in everything that you do, and that you are blessed because of your God. Now, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were blessed because God blessed them. They were blessing to others because God blessed them. This all goes back to the Abrahamic covenant. I know we've hit on it a lot, but that's the whole point of this whole uh, massive chunk of Genesis. Leave your finger here and let's flip um, back to Genesis 12. And we're just going to quickly read the Abrahamic covenant, the foundation of it. So flip to Genesis 12, 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's the Abrahamic covenant. Now, Genesis 15, 17, and 22 all either reaffirm or add to the Abrahamic covenant. You additionally get uh, the geographical region of the promised land included in the covenant. The gist of it, though, is, is that I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless those who bless you, and you will be a blessing to others. And the ultimate is, is the entire world will be blessed through you. That's a prophecy of the coming Messiah. Jesus is a descendant of the tribe of Judah. He is a descendant of Abraham. And that I, you, all of us are blessed today as part of the unconditional Abrahamic covenant that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of. But what we have been seeing here in Genesis 39 is that Joseph is clearly blessed by God. We saw uh, in Genesis 26, 3 through 4, the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant that God made with Abraham, reaffirmed, affirmed, passed on, so to speak, to Isaac. That's in Genesis 26, 3 through 4. Then in Genesis 28, we saw the same thing, the affirmation of the Abrahamic covenant to Jacob. Uh, that's Genesis 28, 13 through 15. And here in Genesis 39, we see that God continues his plan for his people, the Jews, through Joseph. Joseph is a key, key character. God has a plan for the Jews, and Joseph is the key instrument to see that come to pass. Through Joseph, God is going to save the entire region of Egypt uh, through the dreams that we're going to see him, God, interpret for Joseph uh, for the years of plenty and the years of want. Um, and you will see the Israelites become a mighty, mighty nation in Egypt. They will, they will prosper and grow. Um, and then we see the story of Exodus of them return back up to Canaan. But I want you to flip with me now to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. This is Stephen giving a speech to the Sanhedrin. And in the midst of his speech, I mean, he just references Genesis over and over and over again. Um, Genesis 12, Genesis 17, Genesis 15, Genesis 13 and 14, Genesis 21, Genesis 39, Genesis 39 through 50, then Exodus uh, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, uh, chapter 4. Uh, Exodus 3 through 40, Deuteronomy, I mean, all of this, uh, and then back to Exodus, is Stephen's speech to the Sanhedrin. I recommend that you read it. It's fantastic, and it is an amazing tie uh, of the New Testament into the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the foundation of the New Testament. Um, all the elements that we have in Christianity are based on uh, Judaism are based on the Hebrew Bible as our Old Testament. That's a totally separate tangent, but we're going to read, uh, and we're going to pick it up at verse 9. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, now that's specifically referencing Joseph's brothers, uh, Jacob's sons. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. 
But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. You can continue and read on, and it'll tell us what we're going to be reading next in Genesis. But the point here that I read this is God was with him. This is a key part. I, I, I want to reemphasize this. The story of Joseph, Joseph is not the story of the success of Joseph. It is the story of God and his provision and following through on his promises. Make no mistake about that. And we do see in Joseph how we are called to live. And we'll talk about that at the end when we talk about um, application and the modern application. Okay, so now continuing on, Potiphar's wife. Uh, Potiphar's wife. Okay, so uh, flipping back to Genesis, we have verse 7 through 10. Joseph's a good-looking guy. Uh, he's well-built, a uh, young man, good-looking, and Potiphar's wife uh, totally gets the hots for him, lusts after him, and starts uh, not too casually flirting with him and making passes at him and straight up saying, uh, dude, you're good-looking, come sleep with me. What can Joseph do in this situation? Try to put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Keep in mind, it's not that Potiphar's family has simply hired him as, uh, you know, the account manager for his estate. Now, he's a slave. He is a slave. He is property that was purchased by Potiphar for Potiphar's family. He has been blessed by God, and Potiphar has acknowledged that, that, wow, this guy is very successful at everything that he does. I'm going to put him in charge of my whole house. And that's what Potiphar does. But when Potiphar's wife starts making these passes at him, what are the options that, that Joseph has? I mean, it, it's really, I guess there's three options that he has, right? Option number one, uh, he can sleep with Potiphar's wife, which if he does that, um, I mean, obviously that's sinning against God, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but that also would then bring down the wrath of Potiphar um, and would jeopardize his entire situation. And he knows if he was caught in that situation, he'd be killed. So there's that one option is give in to the sin and die. Uh, the next option is what would happen if he were to go to Potiphar and say, hey, man, your wife is... Uh, coming on to me. A slave, I don't believe a slave would even have that option to be so bold as to say something against uh, the the matriarch, uh, against Potiphar's wife. Option number three is to just avoid it, is to just quietly say no and completely stay away from her. Avoid her. And that's what he does. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? It's an interesting verse. He doesn't say, uh, how, I could, how could I do such a wicked thing to my master? How could I do such a wicked thing uh, to your husband? How could I do such a wicked thing to God? Interesting. Um, Psalm 51.4, against you, you only, Lord, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Against you, you only, Lord, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You might say, okay, Dave, well, you're taking that psalm totally out of context. Yes, it does say against you, you only, Lord, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. But, but you're not supposed to take Bible verses out of context. Very good point. <laughs> Why don't you join me? And let's flip over to Psalm 51. Leave your uh, marker here bookmark here and let's flip over to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, context is everything. And that verse, it does say, against you, you only Lord, have I sinned. Who is this that says this and what are they saying this in reference to? Join me in Psalm 51, verse 1. For the director of music, 
a psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my inequity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you're right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time of my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Continue reading on. All of Psalm 51 is David's reaction when the prophet Nathan calls him out and says, you have sinned. Now, his sin, if you know the story, you can go and read it in 2 Samuel chapter 11 through 12. You can read that story of King David being up on his uh, uh, palace walls uh, and looking down and seeing on a rooftop this beautiful woman bathing on her roof, and he lusts after her, uh, sends his guards to go get her, and he sleeps with her, and she becomes pregnant. And then, to make matters worse, he, knowing that she is now pregnant, he wants to uh, hide what he has done. This is the king. And so uh, Uriah is Bathsheba's husband, who is this mighty warrior in David's army who's off at battle. So David calls Uriah the Hittite home, uh, assuming that he'll go and sleep with his wife. But Uriah says, no, my place is uh, on the battlefield. And he doesn't. He doesn't even sleep in his own home because his soldiers and his men don't have that comfort. Um, and it's this sin. It's this sin, not only just committing adultery, sleeping with another man's wife, but murder as well. And that is the context of this verse. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? So the point here is that all sin is first and foremost a sin against God. For further uh, scriptural basis for this, you have the story of the prodigal son. This is in Luke 15 uh, is where we get this story. Uh, that Jesus is telling this parable of the prodigal son where um, a landowner, farmer, relatively wealthy man has two sons. Uh, one of the sons says, you know what? I'm done with this family. I simply want my inheritance and I'm out. Uh, and the father says, okay, here's your inheritance. And he goes and he squanders it. He spends all of his money um, and then he is homeless without anything, and realizes, wow, if I was just a servant in my father's household, uh, I'd be eating better than I am now. Uh, so he returns to his father, and he says twice uh, in Luke 15, 18, and then again in 21, he says to his father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. So again, the point being is, is that when we sin, whether it's large or small, we are sinning first and foremost against God. The great thing is, is that Jesus, in what he did on the cross, made atonement one time for all sin. Every sin you have committed and you will commit uh, has been atoned for. So all we need to do is repent and we are forgiven of that sin. Uh, repentance is a key element of that, though. Make no mistake about it, though, you still do have to deal with the earthly repercussions of your sin. So God may forgive you, uh, and you are made right uh, in the eyes of heaven, but whatever it is that you do on this earth, you do have to deal with the repercussions of that. I want to make that clear. Okay, so back to Joseph. Um, if he gives in, uh, he will have to deal with the sin against God and the consequences with Potiphar, which would be uh, his loss of status, but also the loss of his life. Because Potiphar, if he did actually rape his wife, uh, not rape, sleep with her, um, he'd be killed for it. So what does he do uh, eventually when he is, he, he 
avoids Potiphar's wife completely, but there ends up being a situation where he's alone with her. And she grabs him and very forcefully says, sleep with me. And he, he just runs and leaves the jacket that she's holding on to, his cloak. And this has total application for us. There's two main takeaways that we're going to that I'm going to talk about in application from this. I'm going to take a little pause here right now to camp out on this. Sexual immorality, fornication, uh, 1 Corinthians 6:18. Flee from sexual immorality. The King James version has from fornication. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Fornication is very simply any sexual act outside of a husband with his wife in the confines of the marriage bond. It's very simple. It's outlined in the Bible. Anything, anything that is outside of a husband and a wife who are married is sexual immorality. I would go so far as even to say looking at pornography uh, is easily in this this element of fornication. You might argue, and many do, well, there's no harm in looking at things. Yeah, but what does Jesus have to say about this? Jesus specifically in Matthew 5, verse 28, he says, anyone that looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. An unmarried man or unmarried woman who looks at pornography and lusts after that person, you don't even have to look at pornography to be guilty of sexual immorality uh, or of fornication. Uh, In simply having lust in your heart, you are guilty of that. The consequences of pornography are severe. And one of the challenges of it, and the reason why it's such a huge struggle to so many individuals, is that it seems to not cause any harm. Uh, For those that aren't married, what's the harm? I'm not even married. I'm not even uh, in a relationship. So what does it matter? You are setting up an expectation for yourself and for your spouse that cannot be met. You are killing your future enjoyment by destroying the expectation of it. Then if you're married, again, you are putting this massive blockade in between you and your spouse that, that, that causes damage, it causes separation, uh, and it limits this amazing gift that God has given to us. It limits the potential for that. One of the things that the Bible says that scares me as a husband is that it warns us, it warns us that your, your prayers can be hindered. If there's something as a husband that is between you and your spouse, it can hinder your prayers with God. So don't let anything come between you and your spouse. Don't let anything come between you and your wife. That is such a sacred element. And the idea that that my prayers to God can be hindered because of unresolved uh, sin or conflict that I have with my wife, well, that should give any... Any Christian pause, because anything that comes between me and God, that's a big issue. So make sure that you honor your wife or your husband and that you don't defile the marriage bed uh, by sexual immorality. Verse 12, we see Joseph do the right thing. He runs, he runs out the door. So this is a perfect example for us. Are you dabbling in sin? Are you, uh, I mean, we're talking about pornography a lot. Uh, Do you look at the swimsuit calendar or when catalogs come in the mail, even if it's athletic clothing, do you flip through? Well, it's not pornography. They're not naked, but do you still uh, flip through that? You're, you're teetering on this, this slippery slope. Run from it. Absolutely run from it. As we see the example that Joseph does. There are actually a lot of similarities um, between uh, the different chapters of Genesis. In Genesis 38, uh, just in last week's study, we looked at the things that identified Judah, right? Do you remember this? We looked at the signet 
uh, as well as the um, his staff, which are both identifiers that he gives to Tamar when he has no idea who she is, um, and they are used to identify him later on as the man that slept with his daughter-in-law. Well, here in the same uh, element, we see Joseph's cloak, um, and it very likely could be the same um, uh, coat of many colors. We don't know. Uh, it's been a, a good chunk of time that's passed. Uh, it might be that same cloak, but it is it's used to identify him and to accuse him. With Judah, it's used to uh, show his guilt. Uh, and then with Joseph, it's used uh, to convict him of a crime he did not commit. So continuing on, what does Pot Potiphar's wife do? She tells everyone. She uses the cloak. She claims attempted rape, uh, which is a scary, scary thing. I was talking to a friend of mine, and one of the things that... Um, has come out of the whole Me Too movement. Make no mistake, I want to have it clearly known that there is no place for men taking advantage of women, or vice versa. That's not as common, but I don't care if you're rich. I don't care if you're famous. I don't care if you're a politician. I don't care how much power you have. You need to be held accountable for your actions. And the whole Me Too movement uh, really did that. Uh, but with that, you also have now women who are using rape as uh, a way to get back at individuals. I was talking to a friend of mine that had um, her son is in high school and heard stories um, of classmates of her son that uh, were accused of rape. They broke up with a girl. They dated for a week. They broke up because it just wasn't working out. She was toxic, and he didn't want to have anything to do with her, and she claimed rape, and it was just his word against her word, and it it destroyed him. I mean, imagine that being a, a high school senior uh, and and having the entire class, all your classmates and parents, think that you raped another high school student. Horrible. Horrible. I, I can't imagine. So the caution there. Whether you're uh, in high school or college, uh, be very careful. Um, double dates, group dates, uh, dating is a dangerous game. And my caution to you is make sure that you are very sure of the character of the individual you go on a one-on-one -on -one date with. Um, and even then, it's very wise to always be around other people because uh, you never know that beautiful, wonderful girl that you've taken on two dates very well might be Potiphar's wife, uh, who, when you break up with her, because clearly she's got some issues, might lash out against you. Total tangent. Sorry, let's keep going. So now let's talk about Potiphar himself. What does Potiphar do? Notice that, well, I'm still in Psalms here. Um, notice that he is filled with anger. When, the mas when his master heard the story his wife told, saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. What are Potiphar's options here? Think about this for a second. Put yourself in Potiphar's position. Your wife has claimed that the servant that is the complete head of your household, who you totally trust, who has made you great wealth, who you love like a son who you have put in charge of absolutely everything, she accuses him of attempted rape. We see he doesn't say, what is this thing that you have done? He doesn't say, why did you do this? How could you break my trust? All we see is that he's filled with anger. Then we see that he puts him in Pharaoh's prison. Now, uh, historical context. If I believe, this is my interpretation, uh, I believe that if Potiphar thought that Joseph had tried to rape his wife, he would have killed him on the spot. In historical context, he would have had every right to do so. Uh, Joseph was a slave of Potiphar, and there is no question whatsoever 
a master would have full right if such an accusation came, even if there was a thought, even a chance that he thought it was true. He could have killed him on the spot and everyone would have been sympathetic to the situation and said that was the right thing to do. My interpretation, I think that Potiphar knows his wife. I think Potiphar knows full well what his wife tried to do, and he knows that Joseph was the upstanding guy. So he doesn't uh, put him into general prison. He doesn't kill him. He doesn't put him out in chains doing slave labor. He puts him in the king's prison, in Pharaoh's prison. This is a spot for political uh, prisoners. I believe that this was the best thing that Potiphar could have done in this situation. He has to do something. If he sides with Joseph, he goes against his wife and his wife's claims uh, against the servant. And he cannot do that. Societally speaking and for the future of his marriage, he can't take the side of the slave. He has to take his wife's side, unfortunately. So as a result, he does, in my opinion, he does the best thing he possibly can. And he puts Joseph in prison, in the king's prison. And we're going to see, if you continue reading on, the rest of 39 and all of 40. Yet again, God blesses Joseph and he prospers in this situation. So that's it for this week as far as context, but takeaways... Questions for discussion. How do you respond to adversity? How do you respond when the going gets tough? There are many Christians I know that are solid believers that complain constantly. They complain about uh, the economy. They complain about politics. They complain about uh, the situation uh, that they're in. The sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. God is in charge. And when we look at Joseph, we see an example of what it means to truly trust God in anything and everything. Joseph was going to be murdered by his brothers and then is sold as a slave. The only people he knows that he thinks love him sell him into slavery. He then travels down to a land he doesn't know as a foreigner uh, and then is sold to uh, the, the, the head of uh, Pharaoh's guards. He could have been miserable. And then, and then he's accused of rape. He, he ascends very well. He does well. He is put in this great high position and given all sorts of responsibility uh, in Potiphar's household. And then he's accused of rape. I could picture, and I'm sure you can as well, Joseph uh, becoming a, a drug addict, an alcoholic, um, wallowing in his pity, complaining left and right about his family, his family that hates him and how life isn't fair because his brothers hated him and wanted to kill him and then sold him into slavery. He could be sitting there complaining about the political strife that he faces. Politics, hello, uh, the the king of the guard, he's a slave. Talk about political uh, insurrection. Uh, and then uh, talk about... Um, Potiphar's wife accusing him of this thing that he didn't do, being falsely accused. The judicial system. The judicial system is rigged. Politics is rigged. Everybody's out to get me. You can totally see how Joseph could be completely guilty of all of that, of, of, of sitting there wallowing in his misery. But what would that say about God? It would say that, that, that God's not capable of doing something great in this situation. Joseph trusts God. So that's the big takeaway of of this week as well as the next few weeks as we continue to look at Joseph. Joseph is a man who trusts the Lord in any and every situation. And if you find yourself complaining left and right about this scenario and that scenario and politics and the environment uh, and the judicial system and the courts and the schools and kids these days, just ask yourself, how does that reflect Christ? Are you truly trusting God? 
Or are you wallowing in your situation and are you telling the rest of the world that you don't trust God? Pray on that. Think about that. That is a great line of questions to discuss in your small group with your spouse. It takes a lot of courage to ask somebody that is close to you if you complain a lot. If your spouse and you complain back and forth to each other, it might be wise to ask somebody else that's close with you. Um, the other takeaway and discussion question, how do you handle sexual immorality? You very well might be addicted to pornography or dabble in it and think, oh, I'm fine. This doesn't cause any harm. I challenge you to have the courage to pray on that and as God to reveal his heart on that matter to you. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that don't have the courage to pray that prayer. And if you're convicted, perhaps it's a good time to sit down with your pastor or a close friend and confess the situation that you're in so that they can hold you accountable and you can pray for God to uh, give you the strength because uh, it's through him he can change your heart. God can change your heart and do amazing work in you and free you from uh, the bondage of sexual immorality and fornication and everything that comes along with it. So that also is a good question to ask yourself or your small group. Uh, and how do you respond when you are in a tough situation? Do you run from it or do you dabble in it? The secretary, the person at work, uh, the coworker who asks you out for a drink, ah, there's no harm in going and get a cup of coffee with this person. And then it becomes a uh, routine where you and that, that person, the two of you go and get coffee every day uh, at work. And then it becomes an emotional affair. And then that can very quickly, easily slide into a physical affair. Infidelity doesn't just randomly happen. It's small little tiny steps of sexual immorality uh, that start with emotional, um, emotionally uh, being inf uh, unfaithful. Um, so just be cautious in those situations uh, and, and put up a hedge, protect your marriage, either the marriage that, with your spouse or your future marriage uh, if you aren't yet married. Join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for the example of Joseph. Thank you that we can look at Joseph as an example of how we should act in being uh, trusting and, and, and believing and faithful to you and knowing that you are sovereign and that you can make good out of any bad situation. Lord, thank you that your will is done and that in, in Joseph's situation, how, no matter how bad it is, your will is done, and we see you do what you said you would do. And we see you protect the covenant, and you follow through with your covenant blessing. Uh, and through Joseph, bless Israel and the people of Israel, and the eventual element of your son being the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that I am blessed because of Abraham and his descendants because of you and the Abrahamic covenant. We love you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will give courage and strength to that person who is listening or watching this right now, who is convicted. Help them to confess uh, to you and then also to uh, start the um, process of cleansing, to start the process um, of allowing you to change them from the inside out. Put somebody in their life that they can trust, that can be a um, solid friend to stand with them as they face this challenge together. Lord, thank you that through you, anything and everything is possible. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us so much. Proud this in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, we're going to continue on with Joseph in prison, and we're going to see uh, the king of dreams interpret uh, two more dreams, which will eventually lead to further chapters in Genesis in which uh, Joseph will find himself uh, in front of Pharaoh. 
Have a fantastic week, and I'll see you next week as we continue on in Genesis 40.